Praise the Lord. While you're standing, while you're standing, if you would just reach over and join hands with the person who is standing on either side of you. As we ask the Lord's anointing upon his servant and upon his word today, I recognize that someone who is standing in this vast auditorium today, this may be your very last opportunity to hear and to truly receive the Word of God. And I do not want to stand here in a fleshly demonstration, but I want the anointing of the Holy Ghost to saturate every word that somebody who is headed in the wrong direction can truly be turned toward Jesus Christ. God, we praise you. We glorify and we magnify your name because your name is above every name. It is a name that causes angels to veil their faces it is a name that causes demons to tremble. It is a name that takes a worthless sinner and transforms him or her into a useful individual. Let your name be magnified. Let your presence be glorified. Touch us today. From the crowns of our head to the soles of our feet. If they are sinners, Lord, let them be converted. Believers who have not received the Holy Ghost, let them be filled. Let sick bodies and sick minds be healed today. And we take no credit to ourselves, but we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. And knowing you like we know you, <laughs> we thank you in advance for what you're doing in this place. Thank you. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Just give him another praise and you may be seated. God bless you. You may be seated. How wonderful it is to be in the assembly of the saints of God. Just one more time. We never know when we meet together who's going to be missing the next time we assemble. And that's why we ought to give God our all. <laughs> Whenever we have the privilege, we should remember the words of the psalmist and enter into his gates with thanksgiving. Come into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. Why? For the Lord is. He is good. I want to certainly appreciate my fellow workers on the general board, the first assistant presiding bishop, uh, the Bishop Charles E. Blake, and the second assistant, Bishop J. Newell Haynes, our former presiding bishop, Chandler David Owens, and all of the other members of the general board. 
and we appreciate the Board of Bishops chaired by Bishop Sheard and God bless all of these great bishops and all of our elected officials of the church, our supervisor for the Department of Women, uh, Mother Rivers, uh, nobody like her. <laughs> and we praise God for her. Uh, I said the other night that um, I've had uh, some situations, as uh, Bishop Blake said, physical challenges. And uh, I've seen my wife have to develop another side and she's been nurse and everything else over the past few months, and I want to appreciate her as well. Now, to um, all of the devils and all of the demons and all of those who are hoping that uh, That I, was, that I was going to really be taken out of here. All I can say is na 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 na. I think I just heard Sister Karen Clark Sheard say, it's not over <laughs> until God says. And, and in case somebody don't have the message, just tell them the Lord haven't said it's over yet. say a lot. I, I said to our congregation at uh, Temple of Deliverance one Sunday morning that I was stuck. That was a message I wanted to deliver. And then I wanted to touch upon my personal testimony. And I got stuck between the testimony and the message. And the next thing I knew about 25 or 30 minutes later, we had all finished shouting and I just sat down. <laughs> Whether you know it or not, the God that we serve, he has not changed. Now, we've done a lot of changing since the days that uh, Bishop Mason and others planted the Church of God in Christ 98 years ago. But although we've done a lot of changing, according to Hebrews 13 and 8, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday and today and forever, and he has not changed. He's still the same. He is yet performing miracles today, just like he did 90 and 100 years ago. And I believe that there are persons in this building like myself who have either totally experienced a healing miracle or you are a miracle in process. And God is doing the work. I want to speak to you briefly today from the theme. The Lord gave me this theme, I suppose, about nine months or so ago, reaching the world through the power of the Spirit. 
reaching the world through the power of the Spirit. And that comes out of an Old Testament passage which is recorded in the book of the minor prophet Zechariah, chapter 4, verse 6. And it simply says, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit saith the Lord of hosts. Now actually the words of this particular text are the words where our theme is based. But at the same time, I cannot talk about reaching the world without touching upon uh, evangelization, the responsibility that has been thrust upon us to carry the gospel of Jesus Christ to the ends of the earth. And to talk about doing that in the power of the Spirit, we automatically have to link the New Testament in uh, because it is not an Old Testament subject as much as it is a New Testament subject. When we think in terms of reaching the world, as believers in Jesus Christ, we have a directive to reach the world. But we are also instructed not only to reach the world, but we are instructed concerning what we must reach the world with. Not with foolishness. I think some people read the passages of Scripture and somewhat misunderstood. Paul says that it pleased God through the foolishness of preaching. He did not say that it pleased God through the preaching of foolishness. He refers to preaching as being somewhat of a foolish method. And when you think about it, and look at the countless millions of souls that have been saved in the last 2,000 years since our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ walked upon this earth and ascended on high. And when you think about the method that he left with us to win the world, it is somewhat of a foolish method simply to talk about it and simply to preach about it and especially the way we preach because sometimes when we get into it we might read one or two scriptures and then we tune up and were it not for the grace of God half the people wouldn't even know what we're saying and sometimes when we get off into the spirit and start speaking with tongues we become uh, the church of first Corinthians we become the church that's speaking with tongues and uh, uh, everybody's trying to outspeak everybody else. And if God didn't just break through, uh, nobody would understand what's being saved. So, you know, what's being said. So you could look on the method of preaching as being foolish. But the content of what we have to say, it's to uh, the Greeks, uh, foolishness and to the uh, Jew it's a stumbling block but although it is a stumbling block and foolishness in the eyes of some it is the method that God has used in order to tell men and women the glad news now I did say that it is a method through the foolishness of preaching but not the preaching of foolishness and you wonder sometimes when you look at this world and see the shape that this world is in, how is it that we can talk about everything in our churches 
and sometimes don't even get around to talking about Jesus until what's called Christmas or Easter. I've said it a number of times, but it is astounding to me that many churches today do not even observe communion. You don't hear hardly anything about the precious blood of Jesus Christ that was shed for the remission of sin. So what, what does God do? He always knows how to fill the void. So a few months ago, he reaches out into Hollywood and he takes a producer, actor, who is noted for bloody, violent movies. And he decides to spend $40 million of his own money in order to release to the world a movie entitled The Passion of the Christ. And it made news commentators, it made people regardless of whatsoever walk of life they were a part of, began to talk about Jesus how greatly he was bruised and how he suffered. And it made folk go back to the Bible to see, was it really like this? And when you read it, you find out that Jesus was not neatly put to death, you know, hanging on a cross with those sad, almost effeminate looking eyes and a drop of blood coming out of his feet and a drop out of his hand. But you find out what happened to his back. You find out that his visage, his face was marred beyond recognition. You find out that his beard was not shaved but plucked out. And when you think about what he suffered, Thank God that when we refuse, God always has somebody that he can reach out and bring in and do the job that needs to be done. If the preacher won't preach the gospel, he'll get a jackass. If the preacher gets lazy, he'll get a rooster. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. But the fact is, this gospel must be preached to the ends of the earth. So we have a directive. We have a directive to reach the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Well, Matthew put it on this wise, and I know I'm starting off a little slow, but I'm not going to be before you that awfully long. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Or you might want to go to the end of the book of Mark and uh, hear Jesus in Mark 16 verses 15 and 16. He said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now what a contrast that were those times during the earthly ministry of Jesus when he healed people and commanded them, don't talk about it. They brought a blind man to him one day wanting to see him work a miracle. Jesus took the man by the hand and led him out of town. Healed him where couldn't nobody see what was going on and then told the man, don't tell nobody. And the Bible does not come right out and tell you that those persons who he gave those instructions didn't follow it. 
but usually the next verse or so says, but they want a fame of him. In other words, even when Jesus told them, be quiet, don't tell it, they still couldn't keep it to themselves. But when Jesus himself had finished his earthly ministry, the final instruction that he gave them was capsulized in the two passages that I read. He didn't tell them, don't tell it. But he says, go into all the world and tell it. Preach it to every creature. It doesn't matter if they are not of your nationality. I don't know where we ever got stuck on that thing that we don't ever suppose to witness to anybody but black folk. That we don't suppose to witness to anybody but people that look like us. Have you ever thought about why he gave us the Holy Ghost? You go back and read Acts chapter 2. And right after it talks about the day of Pentecost and how when the Holy Ghost fell, it also quickly brings in that there were dwelling at Jerusalem devout men out of every nation under the heavens. And they heard these men on the day of Pentecost speaking in their language. What was astounding to them was they say, are not all of these Galileans? In other words, they don't know anything but their one language. But yet we hear them speaking in our language. When I read some of the history of the early uh, Pentecostal revival, the Azusa revival, it talked about people that came from all over the world to Azusa Street. Many of them came to criticize and ended up hearing folks speaking in tongues in their language a language which they had never learned. I don't even presume to be such a genius as to tell you how the Lord does what he does. But he gave us the Holy Ghost in order to empower us to take the gospel to the ends of the earth, that we can take it even into those areas where we don't speak the language. I've had some people to tell me, Bishop Patterson, you know, some of my members have said it to me. I was in, somebody told me they were in Rio, Rio de Janeiro. And uh, I know I don't have a broadcast in Rio. Uh, a whole lot of places that I know uh, I'm not paying for telecast. But there's a secret about how man found out how he could take a sender dish and send the signal out into space and it bounces off of a satellite and anybody anywhere in the world that have the receiver dish, the sender sends the signal. And if you have the receiver, you can tune it toward that satellite and receive the signal as it bounces off of the satellite. And I've had members and friends to tell me, said, Bishop, you know, I, I was in Rio, I, I was over in this part of the world and in that part of the world, and I heard your telecast. So, but the thing about it is, I looked and I saw your face, but the person speaking it wasn't your voice, and they were speaking another language. Uh, now, I pray to God that they didn't change what I was saying. <laughs> but all I'm trying to tell you is that if you will send the word of God out, somebody who loves God will make sure that that word that you send out that when it comes back, it will be directed to somebody who needs to hear it. I, I'm trying to say this, and I'm more than a third finish. God will have no Nicodemuses in this day. There can be no secret disciples. Oh, I know that you have people that will say, I don't testify and I don't talk about 
what I believe because I don't think that's anybody's business what I believe. But when I read the demands of salvation, what must I do to be saved? There are two things. First of all, you've got to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. But to believe, you're only halfway there. Not only must you believe, you've got to confess what you believe. Because with the heart, man believeth unto righteousness. With the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. It's enough to say it's in my heart. But if you really want to complete it, you got to tell somebody what's in your heart. Yeah, you, you got to let them know that uh, it's, it's not just that I believe in him, but I want to stand up and tell a critical world, a world that now is trying to do everything in its power. I never thought I'd live to see the day when uh, department stores and many people who depend on the money that is spent during the Christmas season to get out of the red. I never thought I'd see the day when to be what they call politically correct, they will not even use the word Christmas. Now anything that seems to pertain to Jesus Christ. I, I have to, to applaud my preacher from Raleigh. Yes, Brother Patrick Wooden last year uh, I saw him on several nationwide telecasts where he was urging folk that, that if they cannot own up to the 25th of December being about Christ and about Christmas, then you really shouldn't be spending your money with somebody who's trying to wipe out Jesus Christ. I, I never thought that I would live to see the day and it is said that in the United States of America that 85% of all people who claim any religion, 85% of Americans claim to be Christians. And yet we are allowing people from every country, every religion, no religion, Because when you get through with it, atheism is a religion under itself to tell you that to be politically correct, you got to shut your mouth. But I want you to know that if you're going to be correct in the eyes of God, you got to open your mouth. You, you, you got to open it on your job. You got to open it in your classroom. You, you got to open it with the family reunions. I don't mean you have to be obnoxious, but every once in a while, you got to open your mouth and tell somebody. Especially when you see people who are on a downward road. How many folk do we walk by that if you would just open your mouth, you'd be surprised how you could turn their life around. If you would just open your mouth and tell that heroin addict tell that person now who's messing up their brain cooking it with meth those persons that are just out there let them know that honey you may not be able to understand everything I say it may not get through the mist that's covering your mind but I want you to know that it does not matter what's going on in your life if you can confess Jesus Christ as Lord. You don't have to live the way that you're living. I'm glad that I don't serve a savior or a God or a religion or whatever you want to call it. That doesn't offer me anything but suicide and the promise of 42 versions on the other side. 
Most brothers, if you're honest, you may be faking with two or three, but you can't handle but one. Don't, 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 don't give me a religion that's going to tell me if I blow myself up and blow up so many people with me, then I'm going to immediately have 42 versions on the other side and will have pleased my God. My God takes the other position. He said, one day I emptied myself into the womb of a woman and became a little baby in a town called Bethlehem. Grew up teaching, healing sick folk, feeding hungry folk. And for all of the good I did, they ended up taking me to the cross. But I want you to know that I went so you wouldn't have to go. Oh, you can have that religion that wants you to die. My Savior said, I died in your place. I've already paid your price. And all you got to do. <laughs> oh, I feel my help coming now. All I want you to do is believe it. And once you receive it, spread it. Tell men and women everywhere you go who Jesus is. Sit down, brothers. I'm, I'm, I'm almost there. We talk about the gospel. Well, what is the heart of the gospel? That this Jesus of Nazareth Mary's baby that he really was and is Israel's Messiah. I know they're yet waiting on their Messiah, but Paul says what they don't understand is when he comes. And when they get ready to recognize him for the first time, he'll be coming to us for the second time. Without sin, under salvation. I want you to know that that same Jesus is the Son of God and that he is the savior of the world. And once you believe that and confess it, then you are on your way. Uh, I'm not going to say like some folk because we are preaching and teaching that now. Eternal security to the degree that you feel that you came backslide. Ah. Uh, that may be true, but I'm scared to take the chance. That's the way they taught us when we were coming up in the Church of God in Christ. They told us you can backslide. And they also taught us about folk who didn't ever believe in praising God. They said if you can have it and don't know it, and you must not know it because you don't feel it. <laughs> then you can lose it and won't miss it. <laughs> I'm glad that I have it and glad that I know I have it. No, 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 no. I don't walk by feeling. But every once in a while, it happens like they were telling me about Friday night, and I wasn't here Friday night, but tell me Bishop Haynes got up to present Bishop Blake. And a lot of folks said, well, I, you know, I never heard Bishop Haynes speak in tongues. So I, never, so I never saw Bishop Haynes dance. But they said Bishop Haynes started doing like the old saints used to call it, quickening. And speaking in tongues and dancing. And the next thing they tell me of sections somewhere in here started. 
and, and when that section lit the match for about 25 minutes, people were praising the Lord. All I'm trying to tell you is that if you really got it, you may not shout every time you go to church, but every now and then, uh, you ought to feel the fire burning. Every now and then. Please get, give me eight minutes. Now, now, I told you that my, my subject, I had to deal with the New Testament, but the, the, the text really came out of the old. And give me just eight minutes to deal with this Old Testament text. Where the minor prophet Zechariah says, this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Now, when I think in terms of Zerubbabel, my mind goes back to the southern kingdom of Judah. When they were arrested, carried down into Babylon. But you know one thing about God is that before you are ever captured, he has already made provisions for your escape. Before Cyrus was even born, the Lord said through the prophet Isaiah that Cyrus, that he is my servant and that he's going to do my will. And after Nebuchadnezzar had deported these young men and eventually the entire inhabitants of the city down in the Babylon, Following him, the kingdom split on his son. And it became the Media Persian kingdom, divided between the Medes and the Persians. Cyrus had not come along, but he had mandates on his life before he was ever born. Finally, one day when he was born, the Spirit of God moved on him and said, I want you to set those Hebrews free. I, I want a group of them that, that's ready to go back and to rebuild the house of God. I want you to pick out some volunteers. You see, everybody's not willing to do the work of the Lord. Sometimes God has to pick out some volunteers. These people got up and they went back to Jerusalem and they were swift to get into the business of rebuilding the temple. But they soon got tired and they left the building of the temple in order to build their own houses. And one thing about God is he knows when help is needed. So he picks up two what we would call minor prophets, one by the name of Haggai and the other by the name of Zechariah. And through Haggai, he says, tell the people, to ask them a question. Is it time for you, O oh, ye, to dwell in your seal houses while my house lie waste. Sometimes I wonder when you can't get folk to support the Lord's work. Don't they understand that God is not going to bless your work until you do something to bless his work? He said, consider your ways. You've been planting a whole lot but you haven't been reaping very much. You've been gathering wages and put it in bags and when you go back, the bag got a hole in it. Consider your ways. 
And then he looks at Zachariah and said, let him know it's not going to be done by manpower. But this is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. Sin is not by might. I, I just wish you understood, you that's trying to build a mega church and you're going to everybody's conference trying to learn how to build a, a mega church. Number one, you can't even serve a mega church. I, I wish I knew then what I know, know now. I would have never built a mega church. Mm. I want you to hear this. Why? Number one, when Jesus fed the 5,000, he told his disciples, make them sit down in companies, 50 and 100, and take these baskets. Now, Jesus could trust them because what nothing in the basket but what Jesus put in there. There were two fish, there were five loaves. He put his hands on all of it. He broke it. He started every basket. And it didn't matter how zealous any of the disciples were. They couldn't see the folk nothing but what Jesus put in the basket. When you build a mega church, you got some of everybody that's helping you feed your mega church. Some of them are feeding for rat poison. Some of them are feeding what they heard on television last Sunday morning. Oh, you don't hear what I'm saying. Sometimes all you need is enough folk to be able to serve, love, and know. It doesn't make sense to have a whole lot of folk in the church and they've been there 20 years and you don't even know their family name. Can't nobody say I'm talking about you because I'm talking about me too. Oh my God. You need to understand that when God, preacher, puts a vision in your heart, I don't care how many conferences you go to. I don't care how many classes you've been sitting in. If you're going to build the kind of church God wants you to build, it's not by power. It's not by might. Oh, it's by my spirit. What do you mean? The Holy Ghost has got to be the energizer. The Holy Ghost has got to be the one that gives divine direction. The Holy Ghost has got to be the guiding spirit that when you go to church, you may have everything all laid out. But if the Lord says, preacher, I know you've been working on this sermon three days, but I came to bring you something fresh. Today, I don't want my folk to do nothing but give me praise. And why the saints are praising him? Have you ever been in one of those services? Didn't nobody call nobody out. Didn't nobody push nobody down. But when the Holy Ghost swept through, sick folk got healed. Folk that were bound got delivered. And 
couldn't nobody do it. But God, by the power of the Spirit, Stand up on your feet. Hey, Somebody in this building this morning, I don't care how high up you are, if you don't know Jesus, in the pardoning of your sins I want you to find a way to step to the nearest aisle and come down front you need to do that because Satan needs to know that you're giving your life to Jesus hallelujah Backslider, you who have known the Lord, but you're straight away. Church has become a thing that is rare for you. But the Lord says, I'm married to you. That you don't have to get married all over. All you got to do is come on back home. Get up from wherever you are and come here right now. I don't want nobody moving unless you're responding to this invitation. The Lord is speaking. There are at least 125 persons that the Lord is talking to right now. And I want you to come and stand right here. One sister standing there, but there are 124 more that the Lord is calling. Come on. Saints, if you just right there where y'all would begin to give God some praise, yokes would break. Bring it out, choir. I know you're here. I know the Lord is speaking to you. I want you to come on down right now. Oh, bless your name, Jesus. And I know that many of you are ashamed because this is the Holy Convocation and you are already a member of such and such a Church of God in Christ. But let me tell you, we got a lot of folk that's a member of the Church of God in Christ, just like there are people, members of other churches that's on their way to a devil's hell if they don't get their business fixed with Jesus. And it's not about what somebody else is thinking. It's all about what you and Jesus know. While there are... All right, I'm, I, I understand now. I'm told now that because of the situation, the security in this building and the fire laws and all, that people cannot even come down the elevator. But if you would just wherever you are, raise your hand and a saint near you can lay their hand on you and minister to you where you are. I need 
And I want you saints that are standing out there, there are people who are sick in their bodies that need a miracle from God. And while these soul winners are praying with these persons down front, I want you to turn to one somebody near you and catch them by both of their hands and begin to pray with them. And while you're praying with them, pray for God to heal their bodies. Pray for God to save their families. Pray for God to prosper their ways. Hallelujah. While you're praying for them, God's going to do something for you. Hallelujah. Hey, thank you, Jesus. Satan, take your hands off. Presence of the Lord, God be upon you. Woman, God touch you. From the crown of your head to the sole of your feet, receive his presence. Receive his anointing. Satan, take your hands off. The glory of God is being revealed. Mm. Yeah, 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 yeah. Hallelujah! 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 Come on and give him praise. Hallelujah! Woo! Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Woo! God touch you right now. God touch you right now. God touch you right now. touch 
from the master's hand today. Just began to clap those hands and give him praise. Clap those hands and open your mouth and give him praise. been a little longer today than the last couple of official days but but something down in my spirit is saying there are about 2,000 folk out there that just need to praise the Lord with everything in you for about 90 seconds The seconds are up. Come on, somebody shouting around you. Tell them your 90 seconds are up now. Your 90. Praise the Lord. 
Well, give God a hand and take your seat for just a few moments if you can. What a mighty God we serve. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. 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 I'm going to. I'm going to cut this off. But I... I feel another anointing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Woo. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. I want, and I do want to appreciate every one of you who throughout this great holy convocation have been doing everything in your power to support your church. I want to thank God for how he's adding to the church. We, we mentioned the fact that we are thankful for the mayor of Detroit, Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick. What what some of you may not know, Mr. Mayor, is that for the last several weeks, he is not just a mayor of Detroit, but he's a member of Brother Drew Shears, so he's a member of the Church of God in Christ. God bless you, man. And we're glad to have you. Praise God. We praise God for him. Yeah. So when, when, they, when they still try to tell you, said, don't know about Joe and Church of God in Christ, but Happy Jacks. Then we sure got some big Happy Jacks. <laughs> 